Or is that it was good to record? We are recording right now. Okay, we thank are recording you. right now. Uh, so I shall begin now, right? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, really honored to be here um, to be presenting this opportunity to share our work here in Mexico about empowering communities with technology, empowering communities with, with data. Uh, I am Juan Isaac Gámez Baduin. Uh, I am an adjunct assistant professor at two universities. One is in Instituto Tecnológico de Sonora, as the name is Spanish, Technological Institute of Sonora, and the another university where I work is Instituto Tecnológico Superior de Cajeme, which is part of the Tecnológico Nacional de México, Mexico National Technology System. So, uh, about me, I am an environmental science engineer, and I live in Mexico. I am very passionate about data science, geographical information systems, innovation ecosystems, space, technology, and music and art in general. So, the place where I live uh, right now in, in Mexico is Ciudad Obregón, which is in the state of Sonora, just below um, Arizona at the Northwest Mexico. So we are kind of near from, from USA. Well, and yeah, uh, about this talk, we are going to talk today about three main topics. Uh, topic number one, COVID-19 data related projects, two projects about this. Uh, Student projects. I am this semester. I, I am teaching uh, engineering undergrad students at Itson, and we were making some interesting, really interesting data science project. And uh, I'm also going to talk about technological communities and events here in Mexico. So let's get started. I'm going to be talking about these three topics particularly. So first one. Monitor Sonora is one of my favorite projects that I have been involved in my whole life. It's an open data dashboard where we are showing like COVID-19 uh, data, but not only that. As you can see, I'm going to show you the how the web page looks like this. So you can see that this is something like 100% real. So what you are seeing here is like an interactive dashboard that we made on JavaScript. This was uh, mainly made by Alejandro Galaviz, which is the founder of Monitor Sonora. I'm just collaborating in this in some data science and scientific support and mapping. So as you can see here, you can interact with that data from COVID-19, from recovered and dead and infected people. So you can interact with the map. And also you can see that by municipalities, by daily total uh, values in detail, but also we may like uh, this community, Monitor Sonora community, in which we are sharing news and we even have video news that I won't show here because of the time, but if you enter this, this page, you can, you can see. So that's Monitor Sonora. Monitor Sonora uh, has a lot of traffic. I mean a lot for a project like this, like approximately 4,000 4, hits per day, which is like, it's a healthy metric for saying that people is actually seeing Monitor Sonora or Open Data Dashboard. This is the first project that I'm going to talk about. Also, this year, there was a call from a, uh, Talent Land. Talent Land is like a community here on Latin America and Mexico that makes uh, technological events and make communities. So there was a call for a platform for economic reactivation in Mexico addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, <clears throat> we proposed this project, which is called Tip for That, Evolutionary Stable Strategies Revolving Loans and Savings. What is this all about? We won the first place of 120 uh, participants. We won the very, very first place. So what is Tit for That about and what do it has to do with data? Well, this is Tit for That. We have our, our page and, and everything. We have a marvelous team. 
um, Laurent, which is a psychologist, uh, Juliana, graphic designer, Diana, which is a PhD in conductual analysis, and me, environmental science engineer, uh, and I was doing mapping, intelligent mapping. What's tit for that all about, and how does tit for that uh, was good enough to win the first place in the hackathon? Well, tit for that is a platform that um, address the situation of you can have like all the people on the streets because if all the people is on the streets and the public places they're going to get infected by COVID-19 and also you can have all the people inside the houses all the time because you won't hand generate any any money so did for that is a project that uses data analysis and mapping in order to say how many people need to be like outside and inside and at what times in order to produce economic uh, goods that's it for that you can you can see the python code even it's all open we did this on python with uh, population data and the bickery model which simulates how many people needs to be um, outside and how many people needs to be at home so yeah that's it for that the second parade I'm talking about today. And today I'm also talking about a student project, which I'm really, really proud of my undergrad software engineer students, where I'm teaching uh, applied statistic undergrad course at the mathematics department of Itson. Today I'm going to talk about Zombie, which is an apiculture community applied data science research project, uh, where my students are addressing the apiculture uh, problems by doing this platform I'm going to show you. So also I'm going to talk about aquaculture project that my students have been doing. For example, the first one is this one, it's Zumbi. Zumbi comes from Zumbido, which means bus in Spanish and B for, for, for this. So these are my students. They did like a really really cool landing page they are brandon joel anna and carlos huerta they are have been doing an awesome work in this so what's zombie all about well zombie is a student project that addresses apiculture for example we have here economy and you can see like economic data for bees in states and you can see how um Honey, honeybee production has been evolving in the state of Sonora, where I live. But the most important, the most important part about this uh, very, very simple data science student project is that they're doing open mapping. So the answer that they want to address is the, the next one. What are the ideal places on, on, on the, the watershed where we are living, <clears throat> ideal places for bees? Well, for example, we have here the like apiarios, which are the places where the bees are, and beekeepers are collaborating with my students and with myself to in order to say this place, for example, like, like the upper one is the most productive of all. Well, what environmental conditions are in this place that make it productive, and what other places are equally with equal conditions in order to establish places for the most productive beekeeping. So they are using um, beekeeping data, uh, open data from the government. This is the watershed and all the rivers. And they are also using Landsat, day, Landsat 8 um, OLI for obtaining NDVI from, from Landsat 8 NASA, NASA, NASA satellite, and also from uh, TIRS, which is a thermical mapper in order to get like the temperature. Uh, this project has only like four months old. We are just beginning and uh, doing this interactive map with satellite data, with government data, and with open data. Um, the other project, student project that I want to talk about is this one. This one was made by Brian and Jair, my undergrad students. They were saying, well, we are, we are in a quarantine mute in, in the pandemic, so is the air quality better because we have low mobility so they were using like uh, for example uh, data pollution from data air pollution and comparing this data with i'm going to go below this with google 
uh, mobility report. So what the hypothesis here? Well, if the people on their houses rise, so more people in their houses, uh, the air quality is going to be better or worse? Well, in this interactive graphic that my students did, we are saying that here in blue, the quantity of people at their houses rise and all the pollutants, the main pollutants we are seeing here go down. Um, these are obviously the first steps and a very, very, very simple way to see it, the complexity of air quality. But I think it's really, really positive for undergrad students to address these problems about these COVID-19 problems, uh, comparing them with our air quality. Also, these very same students, which are um, Brian and, and Jair, did this project, which is Datos de Ciudad, which mean uh, city and, and data. And they took data from a local company, a local theater company that made like mapping of all the uh, events of crime in, in the city where I live. And then they use our language and our studio to analyze this data. For example, you can see if how many crimes are being committed by day of the week, for example, here. And you can also see that Thursday is the most violent day, statistically speaking. And there's pretty much a simple analysis and, and mapping. So what we are trying to do here is to empower students and form new data scientists that are addressing uh, social and important problems such as air quality, beekeeping, uh, and crime. Well, we are going to continue. Continue here with here. Uh, as you can see, a Google Mobility Report that my student used uh, is found here and it's completely open, open data. I'm going to talk also about the communities, which is the third topic of today. Uh, I am the president of the Sonora chapter of Tomelo, Bar Tomelo Valley, which is an innovation ecosystem NGO where I work. We have been doing like a lot of events, science related and, and hackathons uh, along Mexico, Sonora and Sinaloa, uh, Guadalajara, well, what's all these community events all about? I'm going to talk about the most recent ones that we did in here in Sonora, here in, in Obregón, in the municipality of Cajeme, which is Open Data Day 2020, where we were giving workshops, as you can see, about introduction to basic data science with our studio. It was a four hours workshop and introduction to uh, geospatial data with quantum GIS, but uh, open source software There's for our workshop. And as you can see, uh, it's an official event of in here, here in Cajeme. So we took, as, as I was telling you before, this data of crime that was generated by a theater company, because the theater company said, we're going to map every crime in the city and in every place that there was crime there's going to be now uh, art it's a it's something like an artistic performance but with my students we took this data and transform into analysis so in open data day 2020 in my city the event even that we organized there was a theater presentation about violence uh, for this company and also we have workshops and also we have presentations about what, what we can do with data in order to address social problems. So this is a way to democratize and sensibilize people that data and data science and programming and technology is a good way to address social problems, like in a real, real, real way to involve all the society and to teach them that we can do great, great things with, with data. So, uh, along like six years, I have been like a technological activist or something like that. We have been organizing with a lot of um, awesome people, a lot of events, like real lot of events, such as Open Data Day, Civic Hack Night, Data Beers in, in the Tomato Bailey community. We also been doing NASA hackathons, such as Space Up Challenge, such as NASA Data Bootcamp, Hackathon, Sinaloa for Agriculture Hackathon, 
Culiacán Inteligente, which is in Sinaloa about smart cities. I'm going to show you like a few flyers of these events because um, I wouldn't have time to specifically talk about all these events, but I'm, what I want to show you is that what we are trying to reach here in Mexico is critical mass. Critical mass because having a critical mass in, in data science and technology is going to lead us to make the democratization or democratización in Spanish to, is to make something accessible for everyone. Hacer algo accesible para todos, as you would say in Spanish. So we are trying to make like this ser service analytic tools such as Monitor Sonora, make data democratization with uh, hackathons and events and conferences and workshops, data education, which I'm doing in two universities to make data informed decisions to have a better society. That's our, our goal with events such as Open Data Day, NASA Data Bootcamp, also NASA Data Bootcamp, uh, Space Up Challenge, Civic Hack Night, where we are teaching people to program in R, to program in Python. Here I was talking about teaching people how to use Landsat 8 data. And we also have Data Beers, which is an event that just a fit sounds. We are talking about data science project and machine learning project and having beers. It's like a like a gathering, like a informal gathering with with data science topics. Here, you can see myself, uh, and in this slide, I am talking about how the heat island correlates with the NDVI in in a city with the vegetation. Why? because in the city where I, we did this, Hermosillo, the capital of Sonora, the state where I live, is one of the hottest cities of all Mexico. It's a real public health concern. So we were teaching people that with data analysis, satellite remote sensing analysis, we can address these problems. So as you can see here, this is the whole city of Hermosillo and the hot spots are spots that are low in vegetations with tears, um, Landsat 8 sensor, and to the right, you can see NDVI, and the spots with high vegetation, high NDVI, are low on temperature. And here you can see the linear regression that correlates, and I mean, people say, oh yeah, you, you can analyze like the whole city using remote sensing or open data. Um, to conclude this talk, because we have limited time, I want to talk that I also have like a YouTube channel where I'm uploading most of my undergrad statistic classes, mostly on our studio and our language. So also I'm doing some examples like in Python and quantum GIS, but mostly R. So as you can see, uh, well in Spanish, where I have many COVID-19 related data analysis. And also we have this inclusivity on our community. We are including like the artists because we invited like a theater company to speak to their presentation in, in Open Data Day 2020 on our city, but we are also doing Desierto Aeroespacial with our space desert, which is like a art and science project. We are doing these hexagons in the form of the Web Space Telescope. It's like a tribute, an artistic tribute. And we are doing this for getting to more people through art, but, and, and technology. Well, that will be all. Uh, what I also want to say is that we also organized like a TEDx event two years ago. In this TEDx event, we invited uh, Emmanuel Urquieta, which is a NASA medical doctor and many, many amazing people, Daniel Granata, Edgar Pichardo. And we have this whole team of uh, amazing people that was uh, participating. Many of them, such as Gabi, uh, Vianney, Rosalba are active uh, and distinguished member of our community. And I think that it's important to, to address them and to make notoriety of these people that are contributing to, to society, such as a TEDx event. You can see the talks at TEDx990 on YouTube. They're pretty interesting talks. So um, that would be all talking about um, all the democratization, workshops and hackathons, uh, technological teachings, activism, arts that we are doing here in Mexico. Uh, it is an honor to be here again. I'm, I'm really thankful for this opportunity. This is my email, my personal email. So, so you can write me anytime. I'll be happy to, to answer. And that, that will be all for, for my part. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Juan. Um, so we have uh, plenty of time for discussion, and maybe we can dive a little bit more into those projects that you showed us, Juan. But um, are there any any immediate questions for our speaker? And you can feel free to use the chat box as well, um, or just unmute yourself. Uh, yes, Hi, I, oh, sorry. Yes. Hi, um, I had a question. Obviously, there's uh -huh. a lot of open data out there. There's almost too much open data to analyze. How do you go about picking what kind of questions you're going to answer or what kind of questions you're going to get your undergrads to answer? How, how do I pick? pick what kind of questions answer with data? Oh, is, is yeah, that because question? there's so much data, yeah. there's so much open data available, how do you choose what you're gonna focus on? Well, I think that we talk about urgency here. Urgency means that what's urgent in our society, and in order to be aware of this, you need to listen to the people. We have been doing that a lot, a lot, a yeah. lot. I mean, for example, uh, I was talking about crime analysis, which is, this is a Google My Maps platform that a teacher company makes for a crime in my city where you can see all the crime that was committed in January. So I say, well, if the community is generating this data and it's urgent, we need to analyze that data. If the community is concerned about public health, we make these surveys, uh, well, we need to analyze uh, crime. If the community is concerned about the bees are dying, I mean, it's a huge problem in Sonora because Sonora is one of the hardest places in, in Mexico. Bees are dying. Uh, we have a lot of agriculture and uh, pesticides are killing the bees. So yeah, I, I agree there is, there is a lot of data and how do we know what data to use? Listen to the community, to events, to a lot of, uh, listening people and in getting involved with with these companies that are generating data and I, I would say that that's kind of the the secret like getting involved in events and in the community thank you that was a really interesting talk thank you Juan, i actually had a question about you know i i feel that this is since you are listening to the community i wonder what what the response from the local government is about your initiatives and if they have taken up on any of the information that you have produced well working for the government is not an easy thing i would say it's not something that anyone can make as well the government has been like i would say open in a certain way to us because uh for example uh this project that i was talking about uh this vegetation mapping project that you can see here that we made in hermosillo along with my students uh i was asked by the ecological um secretary of the municipality where i live who was my my forest science professor when I was in, in studying the undergrad career. And he said, hey, let's check it out. What are you doing? And I showed him this map, but for my city, and he said that it would be like really cool to implement this in the city. So that was one approach where the government is listening to you, your analysis that you are doing, in which you are listening to uh, a community necessity, which is public health. That will be like one successful case because uh, actually they might like a tiny program on this here in Ciudad Obregón about um, about like hit islands and all that stuff. And I'm so thankful to Dr. Ovidio Villaseñor, which helped us with this. And in some some ways, the government has been like doing like this uh, economical help for the hackathons, for the food for the people, but I will say that it's not easy, but it's necessary because if you want to make social change, you got to involve entrepreneurs, academic students, a government. You got to involve all the <clears throat> all the parts here. So yes, my my answer will be like it's not an easy thing, but it's a necessary thing, absolutely. Okay. 
Okay, any more questions for Juan? We have plenty of time for discussion, so we want to make this um, very informal. Yeah, go on. I am happy to, to answer this. And I'm so really curious to looking forward to learn about you because uh, we have not been doing this for many years. It's like been only like five to six years doing this. So we are just <laughs> learning how to, how to do this. So I, I will be happy to answer the, the questions. Perfect. I, well, you know I what? Want, there uh, was a, oh, there's a I question from that. Um, yeah, so I, I'm pretty curious that you usually involve, um, you know, artistic people in the yeah. project as well. What has been, you know, your experience with that? Do you feel that em empowers them to, or, or makes them curious to, to, you know, to, to use this open data a bit more or, or I don't know, do you think that makes more people get involved in this kind of things? Yes, a lot. For example, uh, two years ago, we were doing this, which is data beers. And our idea was to replicate this uh, uh, scheme where you basically drink beer and attract some people. But we were experimenting with art. How, why is art important? What does a teacher company has to do with open data? The answer is a lot. Why? Because art sensibilize people in certain topics that are important because at least here in mexico most young people i'm talking about 18 20 years like the most early uh, university students are apathetic to most research and science technology applied things so art is a really really powerful tool not only theater but in desierto de espacial which is our 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 project, you can see here on Instagram, we have been doing all these art, artistic events related to spatial science, but not only that, we have been sending this art to some NASA uh, research center. For example, this patch, Medicina Espacial Sonora, was from an event about space medicine and, and open data for, for medical students, but this comes out of an artistic community that is producing all this awesome space and technology related art in an inclusive environment. So we are like, we're reaching people that normally won't be on technological or, or data science events. They are curious because of the art. Oh, it's really cool art and all. But when they are here, they also say, hey, I came here for the art, but I also learned that I can analyze crime in a city and I saw, and also can make value using this. So yeah, I think that more people around the world should like include artistic activities more in, in science, science uh, endeavors, because this is a good way that we have been found allowed along like five years to be effective. And people have responded really, really well. As you can see here, uh, we have some some expositions, some events. We made this drink and draw events where we talk about science and, and we are talking about important uh, topics, but in a ludic way. So yeah, art is a really powerful tool for this. Thanks, Juan. Thank you. So Juan, as far as um, being an early career scientist, um, what are some of the challenges that you face or that you feel that your students face in Mexico? That's a hard one. To be taken seriously, it's hard as a young person. I am 29 years old. I have been an assistant professor for, for five years now. And it's, it's really hard being like like a young person here in Mexico I, I, to be taken seriously in context. So the challenges that my students face are something related to their ideology. They have the ideology of minimum effort sometimes and you have to encourage them like all the time like hey this is this is a cool project for example uh, when I show you the platform that my students made such as the B1 
I have to encourage them. This is going to be a really important talk I'm going to give like Monday. So if you do this, you are going to appear here and get motivated. That That's my one of my challenges as a professor, but as an early career scientist, one of the challenges is to, it's hard to get funding as well as a young, really young person. Um, we got a little bit funding with, with this project, did for that, uh, because we won the hackathon and we gained visibility. So that's a challenge as well. So yeah, my recommendation for early career scientists in Mexico would be like to innovate in the way that you are making your research, but also innovate in the way that you are reaching society, taking to places that technology is not commonly taking. For example, we made a workshop years ago with uh, mothers of family, with these uh, old ladies that wanted to learn how to code. Like I'm talking about six, 60 years, for example, for example. And yeah, they learned how to do basic coding and it was awesome and they were happy. And for example, in this artistic event, we have high school students and junior students that normally are not included in the scientific community. But I have been finding that there are really, really young people that are pretty genius. And if you encourage them to pursue a scientific career, you will have a stronger uh, scientific community with newer ideas and innovation and, and fresh ideologies in order to address social problems because at least here in Mexico, we have um, many social problems that can be addressed with, with science and that are not being made in an efficient way. So I think that encouraging the new generations to lead this way is a, is a good way to, to empower not only communities, but, uh, but cities and, and countries. Thank you, Juan. And I'm wondering, actually, you know, we have, as I mentioned at the beginning of the of, the, of our of our meeting, uh -huh. uh, three new co-chairs that will be stepping up in uh, July 1st. And so I'm wondering, uh, perhaps um, Maya, Lianchong, and Jesse, if you could share with us as well, you know, what are what are those uh, some of those challenges um, that you see in your respective countries, and if you have any particular questions for our speaker. So maybe we can start with Maya. And I'm putting you on the spot here, I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> Maya or, or Lian Chong or Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. Go ahead. Hey, hi. Hi, hello. So, so, so actually in Hong Kong, so, so the government didn't provide a lot of open data for our to analysis and we are actually we are just um, uh, engage the government to open more data for our scientists to do the data analysis so hope hopefully in the coming years the government will open more data for us yeah uh, yes. go ahead Juan um i i didn't i didn't get like like the question like, like I, at the final part can, can you yes. please re repeat yes yeah, so 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 for our um in, in hong kong so actually we don't have a lot of open data um, for our uh, scientists to analysis so normally we just doing some like web scraping to get some data yeah all oh, right 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 well it is a challenge to 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 get uh, open data. For, for example, uh, that this analysis that I was showing to you about like air quality and mobility is done with only one station because we only have one station in the well. We just used one one station for for Sonora, and it's a challenge because if you don't if you don't have many data eh, like in your place, you gotta generate it. For example. I was talking to you about like the like the B project we are doing, Zombie, with my students. There is like zero zero data about this, so we were generating it with a community. For example, here, Zombie uh, uses a little bit of the open data available here, 
but we are also generating it. How can we generate new open data with communities, with communities that I like available to help you? For example, this data that you are seeing here, like in the first map, was generated by talking and, and sitting and, and, and listening to the beekeepers. And this data uh, about crime was not generated by the government. It was generated by a tier company that was like, we, we proposed like to collaborate, they accepted. So my answer will be like, if you have like a data a necessity and it's not available, and it's not being generated, uh, it's good to at least try to, to generate it and make it available to, to the people and share it in events. So uh, eventually there will be like more people that want this open data to exist. And maybe maybe you can like sign a petition to, to the government. And, and, and I think this is a good way. If it not exists, you can create it. Um, obviously, this is not easy and this is not like quick. It's like a process of years and years and years but i think that is really really worth it uh in short i i would say we we didn't have any b data so we created the like a fierce uh bikipedia something like that is 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 the aim of zombie and we didn't have like any uh crime spatial data analysis so we collaborated with a tutor company in order to make this very first draft so my answer will be that one. If there is no data, you go to a community that address that data and attempts to, to create new databases. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, sorry for not being responsive before. This is Maya. I was on a phone call and I couldn't get out. Uh, yeah, well, regarding open data in Slovenia, uh, actually, in the a couple of years ago, the NGO sector started this movement and kind of push also the government into thinking that they need to establish an open data portal. So now we have one, and uh, they and these uh, databases are being filled in now slowly from different fields of uh, public administration. So I think it's a good step towards uh, open data also from the government perspective and can be of course then used by everyone who is interested in receiving this data. And also now in May we had the Ministry of Public Affairs organized a conference uh, on open data. So this is also one, one positive, I guess, uh, outcome of this push from the civil society and uh, towards yeah. the openness of data so i think this is very important step not only from the researchers and science science but also the civil society i think needs to push uh governments into yes. action so and also i really liked your covid example we have something similar in slovenia we call it a tracker covid tracker let's say this is translated and you can also see this daily um daily I know you get the daily data from uh, infections, deaths, and so on. So it's really interesting that this is happening throughout the world. So yeah, really, really nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we, we made this open data dashboard because people were not getting it right. So if it doesn't exist, we, we feel like the obligation to do it. So and yes, I, I, I really strongly uh, agree with you. Uh, if the society is pushing to a necessity of anything, uh, such as um, open data events, open data schemes, uh, the government is going to respond. But for this push to exist, you need to create like a critical mass. And this critical mass can only be created with the democratization and empowering of people, and that requires work work that not many people are willing to do it's like because it's hard because it's you you gotta like talk with a lot of people but i think that the results are, are really nice because uh, this platform is getting uh, a good welcome from the community we, we did like an effort like in the user experience here because we have graphic designers uh, working with uh, us and yeah 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 i agree that Society needs to demand this this in order to to exist. 
But Juan, sorry, actually, um, hmm? sorry. So I, I thank you so much, Maya, for those insights. Um, I'm wondering too because you, when we were when we were talking about doing this uh, presentation and bringing you on for this presentation, um, you you had shown me a picture of I guess the website that the government had created versus the one that you had put together, and I don't know if you could show us sort of the the difference. Um, if you have that example, oh. because yours is a lot more, it's a lot more detailed and a lot more user friendly, I found, than the one that was being made available locally. Yeah. Well, this is the one that was made by like a local university. It was built on our studio, and uh, and we we built this one on on JavaScript. JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. So yeah, this is an example of what we can do as a society in order to improve these tools. Not to compete, but to improve. It's, it's taking a, like, a, here, it, this is the one from, from the government. Uh, it has useful data, daily data and analysis. Yes, it's a scientific tool. But uh, in terms of democratization and in terms of user experience, we found also that our platform is useful because of the design. It's really easy, it's really intuitive, and you also have here news. So this is like the one uh, we made with our team, and this is the one from the government. So yeah, if society is interested enough in a topic, they will do things like this like like this in order to to apport to the to the government solutions so it has here a map something like this person yeah yeah it's quite a difference <laughs> yeah okay are there any other questions for juan uh excuse me uh i'm yeah. i am Lin Chong Zhang. i'm from the and then on the, I think uh, your work is very interesting, and uh, my colleague is doing the, the similar work. So I will introduce you uh, to connect. Uh, I will introduce him to, to connect you. Maybe he have some questions to ask you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Lance. Yeah, I am willing to collaborate with anyone uh, that is willing to make a, like a difference or that wants to make something because, yeah, it's important. Thank you. Any uh, more questions? I also, yeah, I also put the link in the chat box uh, to the Slovenian version and you also have the GitHub link. So if you can, I mean, if it's of any use to you, you can check it out to see how it was done here. To compare. Thank you. It, that's it's, it's really important thank you to include githubs of everything so as, as you see uh all these so projects see, yeah, are on, on the top you have github so yeah yeah on the page yeah i agree it's totally very important to share your code and everything so yeah really useful that's awesome. great as well market museum <laughs> wow this is really nice. See, see, see yeah, like, so like similar. Think, yeah, that looks perfect. I'll just, uh, you know, we are we are a few minutes until the end of our conversation, and I just wanted to um to say uh, thank you very much to Sun for taking the time to present your research and your thoughts. Um, it's it's all been a very 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 interesting and very innovative work. So so thank you and thank you. and congratulations. Um, I should say that you know the, the the goal with our network is to really be able to foster collaboration and active partic participation from from different ECRs around the world. And you know we would love um, your help, Juan, into to maybe uh, creating awareness of our network in Mexico and encouraging people to join us as well. Um, really, the the goal of our our, of our network is to, to advance data stewardship and, and best practices in data management. Um, and so we, we really want to be able to foster and, and um, to have active participation in, in developing innovative approaches to data integration and sharing. 
and you know having you as a member and others in Mexico would be would be wonderful. Um, I don't know, Alice. Did you want to say anything about uh, the network, or, or maybe Rory about the WDS before we leave? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you again. Uh, and yes, I am willing to participate in any initiative that leads, like, um, informed data decisions for a better society and a, and a better world. And I, I, I only want to say that it, it's important to not only make like research papers but it is important to to get involved with the whole 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 society because societies work as a complex system with people from all diversities of all ages of all economic and socio sociological backgrounds so i think that if we collaborate and do this uh and share ideas we can make like a, a best network and include the, the more people because people participate in, in data initiatives when they, they feel included and identified. So that's kind of my innovative approach because of the necessity, because we were having a hard time like five years ago to get people to go to our tech events. And nowadays we have like a, this, I won't say huge community, but a good uh, number of people community that are attending, that are expecting our events with Tomato Valley and with Open Data Day and everything. So yes, I, I will say like, thank you for having me here and anything you can, you can send me an, an email, we will be in touch and I will be really, really happy to collaborate in anything that, that you will like propose in this context. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Alice? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Ron. Uh, it's very innovative, and uh, I really love the like the graphic you are showing because it allows anyone with no specific scientific background to really look into data. So it's really nice to have this social tool uh, to address uh, some very useful questions. Uh, so thank you so much for thank you, thank being you. here and to present your work. Um, yeah, and um, so now we have a new website. So it's uh, now uh, you can go and look at what we have done. And if you want to join the network, uh, you can send an email to uh, us and we have all the information on the website. Um, so, and uh, if you want, uh, as to connect you to other people as well, um, we can, and you forget the address of mm -hmm. Ron, we can be here as well uh, to make the link. I will join for sure. Thank you. Okay. So thank you all for, for being here today. We appreciate all of you and we welcome all of our new co-shares. And so we will definitely follow up with more communication uh, from the network as we move forward. Uh, but thank you for, for joining our webinar speaker series. Greetings from Mexico, Han. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, Alex. Juan. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye.